Uh, so today's presentation, hello everyone, this, today's presentation is going to be about self-organization, but not about self-organization as, uh, as we typically talk about that in, in a team context, um, but in a, in a kind of broader and deeper uh, context. So this year is going to be my ninth anniversary uh, of, of joining, joining Lunar Logic. Um, and uh, and it, it's been quite quite a ride for me. So when I joined the company, it was a fairly flat organization. However, I would say that we had very significant power distance. Power distance is this measure that we use to describe how much more a person high up in the hierarchy can do than a regular employee. And since then, we were on this, on this journey to become what I call a progressive organization. And progressive organization is kind of an um, umbrella term that I use for all sorts of modern management approaches that are based around autonomy and not uh, as opposed to a distributed autonomy as opposed to, to hierarchy. So, so we started distributing autom autonomy across the whole team. We started increasing transparency. We started applying self-organization on all levels of, of, of the organization up to a point where we started talking about radical autonomy, radical self-organization, radical transparency. And after four years in autumn 2016, I published that message uh, that basically said that this process had been done, that we were there. The whole authority and the whole autonomy that I had as a CEO was distributed to everyone at the company at Lunar Logic. So the thing is that right now I look at this message and I'm like, what? I, I would never write that uh, again today because uh, now I realize that that process couldn't be uh, couldn't be done because it, it it will never be done because even if we can distribute authority even if we can distribute the decision making power to everyone we cannot do the same with with autonomy so so uh, uh, so after those four years in 2016 uh, our intern could fire our CEO but would they they wouldn't uh, because it is one thing to have a theoretical power to make a decision. And another thing is to actually use that power and make that decision. And there is exactly, that, that's exactly the difference between authority, a, a, a power to make a decision and autonomy, actual use of that power. So, so given that, that we have new people joining us and catching on board, get, like, like getting on board with, with autonomy and learning how to, how to use that power, this is one thing. The other thing is also that making decisions is related also to responsibility for the outcomes of, the, of, of uh, those decisions. And not everyone wants to take that responsibility. So obviously not everyone would be, you know, participating in this, in this autonomy based uh, work environment. Uh, so, so when I was sharing our journey, I, I obviously was sharing, you know, like how good it was to us to become this progressive organization, uh, to become the, this organization where, where autonomy is, is really radical, where self-organization is really radical. And uh, th this is probably a slide, uh, slightly changed that I shared a couple of years back. And it shows kind of three parameters that show how well we were, we were, uh, we were doing over the course of, of, of five years. The blue line uh, shows uh, the financial, financial standing of, of the company and it was going steadily up. Uh, the red line is showing uh, team stability and th this is actually retention. So it stabilized, uh, it, it stabilized at, at really high, really unusual for the IT industry level of 90%. And the green line is uh, perceived engagement. So how we see our engagement at, at, at work. And during the transformation, uh, the perceived engagement went up almost twofold and then stabilized on, on, this, on this high level. So if someone back then, a couple of years ago, asked me, you know, like, what are my predictions? What would happen in the future? I would probably uh, say something like this. I mean, like, no, no one asked me, so it's easy to speculate right now. 
Um, but I would probably say something like this, that I would expect our financial our financial situations to, to be better and better. I would expect uh, the, the, the uh, team stability to remain on this outstanding level. And I would expect and hope that uh, perceived engagement would be going slightly up. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect like huge changes on that account. However, two, two years, two and a half years have passed and I have a comfort of actually validating that hypothesis. And what happened? So first of all, it seems that when it comes to the finances, I was fairly conservative. So we were doing much better than I would hoped for. And that's actually the end of good news on this chart. So when it comes to team stability, it, uh, it went down. Uh, it went down by 10%. So retention for, uh, for the last couple of years is around 80%. But actually the, the sad part is what is not seen on this chart. So when I was preparing to, to this presentation, I wanted to say that, okay, it's only five months uh, into 2021, and I already know that the disc curve won't go up because we already lost as many people this year as we lost throughout the whole last year. Well, as for yesterday, uh, it's no longer true. I actually know not only won't it go, go up, but it will go down. So another, another person uh, decided to uh, to leave Lunar. And it's not only about, about the numbers, it's not only about how many people have left the company, but also uh, about the experience. So among the people who recently left the company are some of the most experienced people we had on board. But actually, the saddest part of, of, this, of this picture is the green line, which shows perceived engagement. Well, I was hoping it to go somewhat up, it took a nosedive. It took it took a nosedive, uh, and and is and right now the perceived engagement is as almost as slow as it was before we even started transformation. And just to complete the sadness of of uh, this snapshot, I have one more uh, statistics to uh, one more bit of data to share, which is how we perceive the atmosphere atmosphere at at, at the company. And it basically shadows the uh, engagement curve. So over the course of two years, we managed to go from a point where it was fun to work at Lunar. This was this, this great company doing some, some really progressive things with, with management, giving, giving autonomy to people, creating an environment where people, people can feel inspired to basically a situation where it sucks to be at Lunar. So a good question would be to ask, what went wrong here? Where did we make a mistake? And what kind of a mistake we made that, uh, that we fall so quickly? And actually, I think that a much better question would be to ask what went wrong here? Far earlier than we saw the impact of that mistake. And to answer that question, I want to summon uh, Stephen Bungay. In his book, The Art of Action, Stephen Bungay proposes this, this, this thinking model. So he basically plots alignment and, and autonomy as, as two dimensions, two dimensional space. And each organization can be uh, put somewhere in, in this space. So first of all, we have organizations where there is little autonomy and little alignment. And in those organizations, people don't feel empowered and they don't really know where to head. So there is a lot of inaction and a lot of confusion. Then we have organizations when, when there is a, a high alignment, but low autonomy. And in those organizations, we do have clarity what we are trying to achieve. However, we don't, we don't feel empowered to, to act. So uh, despite the clarity, we see a lot of micromanagement. Then we have organizations where there is a lot of autonomy, but little alignment. And in those cases, people are, are, are willing to act. Uh, they, they, they are empowered. However, their effort is not orchestrated. They are not rowing in the same direction. And finally, we have the sweet spot where we want to be. And this is a place of effective targeted action. And this, is, uh, th this happens when, when you have an organization when there is high autonomy and high alignment. Now, Stephen Bungay doesn't stop here. He also tells us how to reach that point. And he says that 
first we need to increase alignment and only then we can increase autonomy. So how, uh, how we did uh, at Lunar uh, uh, in comparison to that model. So, uh, so first of all, uh, there will be some uh, there will be some dashed lines on this on this chart. Uh, dashed lines it, uh, are not based on on, on the actual data. The, the, this is basically my interpretation of my observations of what was happening at Lunar over that time. So, so when it comes to autonomy, it was steadily growing over time. So, for the first four years, we were we were making the changes uh, in what kind of decisions people could, could make. Uh, so the, it was kind of the, the, the space where we were increasing authority. But even if there was a full authority, people can make decisions about, you know, setting their own salaries or hiring or firing or anything else. We were still in this process of increasing autonomy. So seeing people making more serious decisions, seeing more people making more serious decisions, seeing more people making more serious decisions more often. So the autonomy curve is going steadily up over that time. What, what, what was happening with alignment then? Well, if I tried to, if I, if I wanted to plot alignment level uh, at Lunar, it would probably look like this. So, so when I joined the company, it was going, uh, it was going through, through some financial uh, troubles. So it was kind of easy to set this, this kind of an interim goal of reaching the point of safety. So basically, you know, like earning enough that we have this, this uh, cash buffer that allows us to go through, you know, some months of, of a downturn. And soon after we reached that, that, that goal, so an insane CEO uh, would then set up another goal, probably more aspirational business goal for the whole company. Unfortunately, we were not blessed with a sane CEO um, because I refused to do so, basically. My hope back then was that, uh, that some kind of a strategic goal, strategic aspiration would simply emerge out of, you know, like everyone, everyone's hopes and desires, what they want Lunar Logic to be. And obviously it didn't happen. As you may guess, we just wasted some time. Later on, I still kept to, to this hope that, you know, whatever our, our, uh, business aspiration would be, it would, it would somehow combine our, our collective desires. So I started kind of moderating and facilitating that process. And that's probably the most difficult thing that I tried at Lunar. Long story short, we are not yet there. We are still discussing, discussing what our strategy uh, and what, what our business aspiration should be. What is important though, is that we still are not working on increasing our alignment. So over time, the gap between alignment and, and autonomy was growing. And if you want to think, you know, like what are the consequences of such, such a model, you can, you, can, you, you can use another metaphor. So, so, so think of the circle as an organization and each arrow within this circle is, um, it's a person within that organization. And obviously people have different desires. They are not necessarily aligned altogether. So how a traditional hierarchical organization would set up their identity, would establish their identity? Well, it would probably, the process would probably look like this. So we would find a person who is in power, probably a CEO or a group of people like on the very top of the hierarchy, we would ask them, you know, like, what is the vision for this company? And that would be it. The company would start progressing toward that vision. Now, obviously some people in that organization would realize that, well, that's not exactly what they want to do. So they would leave. And if that company is doing their, their HR in any reasonable manner, they would probably uh, hire people who are more aligned with that vision. That would only help the company because the pace of progress toward this, this desired vision would, would, would be only, only higher. What we did instead was we started with increasing autonomy. We, we started with increasing uh, sphere of influence of everyone at the company. And only then we started asking people, you know, like, hey, what do you think? You know, like what the company should be doing? What should be its aspiration? What should be its business goal, etc." So we started hearing, you know, like all sorts of visions and they were all over the place. 
And uh, even if the, those visions were all over the place, there was some kind of a momentum, some kind of a direction where the company was heading, even if, you know, like for quite some time, the strategy was not explicitly set up. So if you think about, about those arrows as, as kind of forces, there is some sort of a combined force that would be applied to, you know, to, to the whole group. And thus people started realizing that, hey, that's not where I want my company to go. That's not what I hoped for. That's not what I signed up for. And thus we started seeing frustration. And if disappointment is a gap between expectations and reality, well, then this is literally a recipe, a recipe for a disaster, which indeed arrived in, the, in a timely manner. And I wish it were the whole story, but it wasn't. So, so when we are talking about self-organization and autonomy, there's probably, you know, like kind of a way how we explored and discovered th those concepts and how we deepened our knowledge about those. So I will share my story. It's not necessarily, you know, like the story that, that I would expect everyone to share, but I just want to show how complex the topic is. So I, I learned about the, the idea of self-organizing teams from, from, from Agile. And then there was a realization that self-organization is, is, is basically a practice uh, that implements kind of a, a, a more generic idea of autonomy. And then based I, on my ex uh, uh, experience at Lunar Logic and, and, and earlier experiences, I, I realized that, that autonomy and transparency have to go head to head. So you cannot give people autonomy without giving them transparency because then they would be making random uninformed decisions. You cannot give people transparency without giving them autonomy because then they would see all the stuff that is happening. They would realize that they have no influence over, over the situation and you would invite only frustration. So these two are interdependent. Then uh, from Dan Pink, I, I learned that autonomy is actually one of the things that you need to provide in order to keep people motivated. And oh, by the way, there are the other two, which is mastery and purpose. And then from aforementioned Stephen Bangay, I learned that autonomy is dependent on alignment. And alignment is actually nothing else than an implementation of, of this more generic idea of a common purpose in organization. And then in a completely separated, separated thread, I learned from Professor Ainta Wule uh, about the collective intelligence and how collective intelligence uh, makes, uh, makes teams more effective. And also that collective intelligence is to some point dependent on diversity. And then from Amy Edmondson, I learned about psychological safety and how diversity uh, actually feeds on psychological safety. And then, kind of uh, uh, connecting the dots from, from different inspirations um, and connecting, con connecting the dots between this management model built around autonomy and my experiences in Lean and Kanban, I realized how the same way as we, uh, uh, as we employ uh, explicit constraints to streamline the work in Kanban method, we need explicit constraints for autonomy because if there are no constraints, giving autonomy would, would basically we would basically mean, mean that we can do anything and we would be petrified by all the choices that we can do. And when we are at Lean and Kanban, you know, there is there is this, this, this thing from Lean that is respect for people and it and actually it's needed if we want to sustain a diverse team. And then when you think about autonomy and people making decisions, you start thinking about the responsibility that that that, that uh, that you expect from people when they are making decisions. And then based on discussions with Jay Bloom, I realized that it's like responsibility is not even the right way to frame it because Jay uses the word agency instead of responsibility, which is a combination of having autonomy and caring about the outcomes of, 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 of my actions. And then from David Marquet, I learned that uh, technical excellence is also needed in order to, uh, to create autonomous organization. And technical excellence is, by the way, nothing else that implementation of mastery that Dan Pink was talking about. And then I saw how diversity is dependent on, on alignment as well. And also learned uh, based on our uh, ex uh, 
uh, on our experience at Lunar Logic, how, how inclusion is also crucial to uh, sustain diverse team. And by that point, it's like your brain is just about to blow because there are just too many things to take care on concurrently. And if you remove a couple of them, well, you, you can start thinking about this model uh, in this kind of a way. It's like a house of cards. So think what happens when you remove a couple of them. Well, you don't expect the whole house to hold, right? So actually, even though we failed with some of those things, I, I already shared I already shared the story about alignment. There's another one I want I don't want to go into details with this one. Uh, but we also failed. Uh, we also failed miserably uh, to a point with inclusion. Uh, so, so when I hear diversity is awesome, my re my reaction right now is like diversity without inclusion is worse than having no diversity at all, because diversity brings all, all sorts of different opinions, different beliefs different behaviors and if you don't have inclusion if you if your team didn't learn how to uh, appreciate accept uh, those different behaviors different different opinions different beliefs diversity only creates tension and in our case uh, we had some some um, serious tension going on because for years, for years, we were building a diverse team, but we weren't aware of, we didn't take care of enough inclusion so that everyone felt welcome. So just to show, you know, like just to show how well we were doing with diversity um, uh, last year, I think it was last year I was talking at, at HR conference and, and there was this question, okay, so you're talking a lot about diversity and you are an IT, uh, IT organization. So, so, you know, like uh, how many women are in, in your company? And my answer was like, well, uh, there, there's less than 40% of men uh, at Lunar Logic uh, because like um, talking about, um, we don't have, we, we don't only have people who, who perceive them they, themselves in a binary way, men versus women. Um, so, so that was the answer. And there was a follow-up question. So, ha ha, yeah, sure. So, how many of them of them are engineers? How how many of women are engineers? And I was like, well, when it comes to engineers, only one third of them are men. So this is how far we brought we brought diversity. Uh, nonetheless. We screwed up on another account, which is which is inclusion. So our uh, our house of cards was interestingly enough still holding up to a point where the pandemic struck. Now, what happened when uh, when we entered the lockdown? Well, we obviously switched as as uh, probably all the IT companies. We switched to remote work. And we started seeing different dynamics in the way we collaborated. So historically, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff was going on at the office. So there were a lot of uh, the, there were a lot of conversations that were happening face to face. And when you are talking to someone face to face, you see their body language, you see their emotions. Suddenly, we were we were uh, down to asynchronous communication on Slack. By the way, Slack is evil. The thing is that when you have this asynchronous chat, you don't see the emotions, you don't see the body language. Not only this, uh, but you also filter the message through your lenses of someone else. And there is no instant feedback loop that the other person can correct you. So you start applying your own biases, your own prejudice on the message that you received from another person and then respond to that, which is probably more aggressive than it should be. And the other person does the same. And we, we have this vicious cycle and we already had the diverse team with, uh, with, with a lot of tension. So that tension started, started uh, basically skyrocketed, but not only that. When we were at the office, 
in, even despite all those all those conversations that not necessarily uh, were were easy, we had all the opportunities to bump into each other every now and then because we were eating lunch together or having coffee having a coffee together, and we couldn't help but see in the uh, in the other person a a decent human being. So it was kind of bringing the, the, the this whole conflict to a neutral level, and suddenly. We were deprived of that. And not only that, because of the pandemic and being closed in our homes, people started having, having uh, um, more, more problems with their mental health. So they started limiting uh, interactions with, with others. So, so we had e e even less social clues about the others and, and feel even less connected. Not only that, as if that was not enough, we had some really serious uh, political and social uh, stuff going on in Poland last, last autumn. And it was impossible not to express some of, of our views. And that basically added more fuel to the fire that was already raging. So what people did was they, 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 they started retreating to their support groups, which, Coincidentally, were also eco chambers, and and those biases and prejudice started playing even even stronger role because if I feel hurt by someone and I retreat to people who think the same I am, they would basically pat me in the back and tell me, "Hey, Pavel, yeah, you you have all the right to feel hurt, and we'll we'll be here to defend you." And then the conflict suddenly involves more people than just two. And at some point, everyone, literally everyone, maybe not everyone, but many people at, at, at the company started literally feeling bad and hurt. So uh, Daniel Cole in his book, The Culture Code, mentions three characteristics of strong and effective organizational cultures, which is building safety, sharing, vulnera uh, sharing vulnerability, and establishing purpose. I already shared a story how we, um, failed to establish common purpose, how we failed to align our efforts. But what the pandemic uh, uh, brought to us was we were deprived of those signals of connection that we are part of some, something bigger than just you know, a group of a few people. And without those signals of connections, we were, we were deprived of, of the bonds of belonging and common identity. So if I try to plot the belonging, the sense of belonging on our chart, it would probably look like this. Over the years, we were building systematically the sense of belonging uh, for the whole group, for everyone who was at Lunar. And then it slowed down at some point uh, uh, because you know, like I mentioned some, some issues with, with inclusion. I mentioned already a very diverse team, but then when we entered the lockdown, we were starved of our belonging clothes and it took a nosedive. And where frustration meets lack of belonging, you really cannot expect anything good to happen. So from a perspective of time, our failure story uh, is not a surprise. We should have seen that coming, even if we didn't. So to sum it up somehow, uh, a good question to ask after this failure story is whether self-organization and autonomy is applicable only in a team context. Maybe we shouldn't be aspiring to scale autonomy and self-organization up throughout the whole throughout the, the, the whole hierarchy. And I have three answers to that. And I warn you, two of them are not very optimistic. So first answer is that I don't really expect us as, as, as the industry to do a full ass job, you know, uh, applying autonomy or applying self-organization on all levels of, of the organization. Why? Because we don't do full ass job with literally anything that is on this chart. I mean, show me one thing on this chart, one topic, one idea that we really, really did a good job with. There's nothing. 
you know, like like autonomy is 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 in the center of pretty much any progressive management method out there. You would find it in Don Reinertsen's flow when he's talking about decentralized uh, decentralizing control. You would find it in David Market turn the ship around when he's talking about um, uh, about uh, making uh, a an atomic submarine uh, the best in class. You would find that from Deming's lean to Lalu Teal, it's everywhere. And yet we are just applying it like, like just a spice on a meal. The other sub message is uh, that I don't think that management revolution is just around the corner as some of the management thought leaders would, would, would happily tell you. Uh, especially including Frederick Ladeau uh, telling that Teal will be that uh, that uh, revolution. I don't think so. I mean, we have organizations that are operating with such a model at their core for 50 years already, from 70s and 80s of the 20th century. And it's still not anywhere close to the mainstream. I don't expect that change to be quick and the change won't be quick because it is so complex. You improve one of those things and you realize that you have gaps in three others and you have to focus on improving that, them as well. And that brings me to the third and the last, and, and the last uh, conclusion. JFK famously said that uh, United States United States didn't go to the moon because it was easy, but exactly because it was hard. So trans transforming your organization to this autonomy-based, truly autonomy-based uh, model, autonomy-based management paradigm is not easy. It is difficult. This model is difficult, but because it is difficult, it is not easy to copy and it also brings uh, a competitive advantage to those that would, that, that would successfully apply it. So this is why it is worth it. And this is why despite my failure story, uh, we will still be doing that, treating, treating the, the, that story as a more bump in the road than a critical failure and the system shutdown. Thank you very much. <laughs>